Had you ever thought that there might be a song about you? The prophet Zephaniah teaches us that, G, that God is singing over us. So on your best day, on your worst day, God is singing over you. It means he has not forgotten about what you're going through. He knows who you are. He knows how you are. And not only does he hear our prayers, he's able to answer our prayers. It's one thing, you know, I think a lot of times when we're going through something, it helps to talk to someone else. But sometimes when we talk to someone else, they can't really do anything about our situation. Sometimes they might can, but a lot of times they can't. But God is able, after hearing our situation, to intervene to do something about our circumstances because he has all power. So as I've told you before, the enemy will try to make you believe that you're all alone, which is a lie because God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. The enemy will try to make you think that God doesn't know what you're going through, your specific circumstances, but God knows everything. He's omniscient. And then he's omnipotent, meaning he has all power. So he can not only hear, he not only can see your circumstance, but he can change your circumstances through his mighty power. And so how many of you would tell me, uh, you, you know, you should never lie, but especially not in the house of the Lord. How many of you would tell me for certain, you're not guessing, but you know for sure, God has changed my circumstances. It wasn't happenstance. It wasn't luck. It wasn't fate or what other people say. Let's, let's leave your hands up for a minute. God, at some point in my life or many times in my life, has changed my circumstances. So you see that I'm not alone here. You don't have to take my word for it. You see in the mouths of many witnesses here or in the hands of many witnesses in this case that God changes our circumstances. And so as we go through uh, this series and in this campaign for this year, this 365 challenge, changing our world one day at a time, the purpose of this in reading three chapters of the Word a day and praying at least 36 minutes a day and uh, working uh, 65 minutes a week to minister to someone, to help someone, and then to invite five people to the house of the Lord each month. It's not to be legalistic. It is to establish habits in our lives. The experts, whoever they are, they're probably somewhere with a briefcase or a laptop. The experts will say that to establish a habit, you need to do something at least 21 days in a row. So imagine how we can do this every day for 365 days. What a great... Uh, situation that we will be in, that we're in the Word, we're praying, we're ministering, and we're sharing our faith, we're inviting people to the house of the Lord. It will just become like second nature to us when we do it, not for 21 days, but for at least 365 days. And so that's the reason that we're highlighting that this year, because of the times in which we live. I believe that we are living in the last days. I don't think that we have just forever and ever and ever, amen, to do whatever it is that we want and hope that on our proverbial deathbeds that we are able to make things right with God because we know, uh, and I've just been reminded this week, that your circumstances can change in one moment. A pastor uh, from Wenatchee, he and his wife were on a trip and they were posting pictures on social media. They were having a great time and car accident and she had to be airlifted and, and to a hospital for surgery. In a moment our circumstances can change. And so when I talk about prayer what I want prayer to be is a lifestyle. I don't want you to treat prayer as if God is a 911 operator and you only call upon him when you have an emergency. When you've exhausted all of your ideas and you have used all of your resources, then you're like, oh, oh yeah, let me ask God. One of the phrases that I do not like 
that I have heard many times is, well, we did everything we needed to do, and then we prayed. That is so backwards. Pray and let God show you what you need to do. You know, some people are like, well, why is God not answering my prayer? Maybe because you tried everything you knew to do, and then finally you thought, maybe an afterthought, let's talk to God about it. Maybe that's the reason that you didn't get an answer before, because you didn't ask. We have not, because we asked not, or we've asked amiss after our own lusts, our own desires. And so when we look at prayer, we want to look at uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus, first of all, is talking about how not to do it, okay? He's talking about those who want to be seen in their giving to let everyone know, hey, I'm giving over here, your attention please. I'm giving to a worthy cause right here. I don't want you to miss it. He said, that's not how you do it. To keep your giving private. Just let that be between you and God. Don't make a show of it because if you do that, you have your reward in that moment. And then he went on to talk about, don't be like these uh, religious leaders that get up and they're just like, watch me pray, listen to me pray, I'm so holy. Make a big show out of prayer. Now, we pray in public. I'm not saying not to pray in public. I'm not saying that you can't join with people and pray out loud. You know, growing up in, as a Pentecostal, I don't understand people who say, I don't feel comfortable praying out loud. And I'm like, I don't feel comfortable praying softly. So we're even. But he says to the, to the audience there, and it's true today, is that don't make a big show out of your prayers. You know, don't use vain repetition. But to have a conversation with God. It's not a monologue. You are just not addressing God and giving God a speech that you have prepared or that you're speaking extemporaneously. It should be a dialogue. You're like, what? When at that time, Vice President Pence talked about God speaking to him, some people recommended that he go into a mental institution. But I'm here today to tell you that God still speaks to people and if going to a mental institution is the prerequisite for people that God speaks to, then sign me up. Because God speaks to me through his word. He doesn't speak audibly to me, but I will, and this is why I recommend that when you pray, you have your Bible handy. And the Bible's never been more accessible than it is in this age right now. So most of you have your phones with you everywhere you go. So you have your Bible uh, app handy, have the Word of God handy. As you're praying, many times the Holy Spirit will impress a scripture on me as I'm praying, and then I look that up and it goes along with what I'm praying. That's God speaking to me. But not only does it come out of His Word, or when I've read a passage and, you know, Speaking of phrases I don't like, a familiar passage. I hope and I pray that there's never a part of the inerrant Word of God that ever becomes so familiar to us that we lose the opportunity to learn new meanings from it. Because I can read and hear a verse like John 3.16...
For future believers. But I'm not going to argue with that. It's probably the locomotive uh, has so much steam now, I'm probably not going to change it. But if you want to call it the Lord's Prayer, that's fine, just so you're familiar with it. Because Jesus says, in verse, beginning of verse 9 of Matthew 6, In this manner, therefore, pray. He said, he's told them what not to do, and now he tells them what to do. He tells us what to do. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the glory, a kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Forgive your trespasses. So we see here that we have a certain protocol when it comes to prayer. According to Jesus, and I've been reminded of protocols that people have with the death of Queen Elizabeth II and her funeral and all the protocols that people... in at the last minute and say what's up I'm so glad to be here hey Elizabeth hey Liz how's it going that's not how you approach the Queen of England but how do we approach the King of Kings the Lord of Lords and Jesus here says that first of all we need to remember that God is our Father we're not saying Oh, mysterious one. Oh, big guy upstairs. Whoever you are, if there's a God, that's not the way that we pray. If we have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. through the regenerative power of God's Holy Spirit. And then he adopts us into his own family. So we are able to approach him, we're able to call out Abba, Father, because of that spirit of adoption. And so when we pray, we're not praying to a stranger. We shouldn't be praying to a stranger. How that you approach your earthly father may be different than how we approach our heavenly father because we are to approach him in a reverent manner. Now, we can come boldly before the throne of God, but we need to do it with reverence because he is holy. His ways are above our ways. His understanding is above ours. And so we need to approach him and remember the protocols because he is God. We are not God. We never will be God. He alone is God. He's the one true and living God. And so we address him as our Father. In this word, hallowed, or if you like to stretch it out, hallowed, however you like to pronounce it, means to give great reverence, to give great 
honor. It means to be made holy, to be consecrated. There is no one more holy than God. God is holy. As a matter of fact, he says to us, be holy for I am holy. He confesses that he's holy and tells us to be holy. Well, actually commands us to be holy. And so we see here that we should start our prayers with worship. It goes back to that idea of protocols. We don't just rush into God and say, I want, I want, I need, I want, God help me. Ah! Oh. That's treating God like he's a 911 operator. But when you have a lifestyle of prayer, then you give God the reverence that he deserves. Because greater than any earthly king is the king of kings. And so before we ask God for what we want or what we need, because if we just rush in and start laying out all the things we want God to do for us, it's not like sitting on Santa's lap that you say, Oh, I want, I want, I want, I want. That's selfish. We need to, before we ask for a thing, we need to give him worship. We need to give him praise. We need to give him gratitude for what he's already done for us. If you are indeed grateful. And if you're not, then you need to come to the place that you're grateful before you approach it. We start out, hallowed be your name because his name is holy. So I guess one thing I'm saying to you is when you get overwhelmed by the circumstances of life, and that can happen, sometimes it happens often, don't just pray, God, get me out of here. Beam me up. Because God has a plan for your life and for my life. And the reason that we are still here is because that plan is not complete. And so, if you want to pray a selfish prayer, you're like, God, get me out of here. I can't handle it anymore. That's selfish. A better prayer would be to say, God, what can I do for you today? How can I advance your kingdom today? How can you use me? How can you work through me to minister to someone today and advance your kingdom? Because here's the thing that sometimes we forget as humans is that Sometimes the way that we receive ministry is to give ministry. Now, we don't think of it that way. You're like, oh, that's the last thing I want to do. I'm going through all of this, Pastor. I'm, you know, I'm just down in the dumps myself, and, and you're asking me to try to help somebody for an hour and five minutes a week. Well, I just don't feel like it. Well, let me ask you to do an experiment. When you don't feel like helping someone, Help them anyway and see if you don't receive help as well. So if you come back to me and tell me that doesn't work, then I'm going to ask you to go step by step through it. Because I've found that when we get our attention, our focus off of ourselves, and we turn that focus outward, that's when we're able to be used in ministry. And I'll talk more about that next week. Spoiler alert. But what we find here is that we are praying for God's kingdom and God's will. That is in contrast to praying for our will. Okay? Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew what he was facing. And he was facing some terrible circumstances. And he prayed, God, let this cup pass from me, but... Not my will. Your will be done. Okay? Now let me just ask you to take a moment and think about your last prayer or prayers in your mind. You're like, well, I've not prayed in a long time, Pastor. <gasps> well, then we see the problem. We need to fix that problem. But think about your last few prayers and just how they went and ask yourself, was I praying my will or was I praying God's will? Now, it's human nature for us to pray our will. God, I want, I want, I need, I want. Help me here, God. I'm at the end of my rope. 
But what if we prayed as Jesus did, because we're to be like Jesus, we're to be Christ-like, we're to grow in our relationship with Christ, to be more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. So why don't we pray like Jesus? Why don't we say, you know, all this is going on, it's fine to lay out petitions, it's fine to have requests, but what if we say and mean, but not my will, your will be done through me. And so we see here that when we're praying for God's will, we're praying that his kingdom come to this earth. Many times what we think of is, God, take me out of here. God, come and get me. I'm ready to go. I'm tired of this. Stop the world. I want to get off. I'm getting a little nauseated here. I want to get off. But we're praying, as Jesus taught us, for God's kingdom here on earth. Okay, I'm going to meddle a little bit right now. You might want to put your feet up under the chair in front of you if you can because I might step on some toes right here. We see that we need to pray for God's kingdom here on earth and God's will here on earth. And one of the problems we're facing in the American church today is that we have not done that often enough. We have not been vocal enough because we are, as an American church, afraid. It goes back to, but God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. We're afraid of losing popularity. We're afraid of people hating us. We're afraid of people threatening us. Why would we be afraid of these things when Jesus himself said, they will hate you for my name's sake? He didn't say, you're going to win the popularity award because you're a Jesus follower, they are going to hate you. They're going to uh, scourge you and and they're going to throw you out of the synagogues because of me. And so I think that there has never been a more important time for us to stand up and to speak up than today. Because we are the salt of the earth. We are the light in the darkness. We should be that light on a hill in this dark world. And I believe that the majority of us would agree. Afraid and to be pushed into a corner because we're afraid we might get canceled. Honey, uh, cancel me already. I don't care. Because nobody in this world, no one who is living past, present, or future has ever done for me what Jesus did for me on the cross. And if I get canceled because of the name of Jesus, then bring it on. But we're praying for God's will and God's kingdom here on earth that we need to make a difference as believers. We need to make a difference. We don't need to be hiding away, locked away for fear like the disciples were after Jesus was crucified when he had to come through the walls into the room to find them because they're shaking and quaking. And they received his Holy Spirit and then they had a boldness to get outside of the locked rooms and take the gospel around the world. We need to be taking the gospel into our classrooms and into our family reunions and into our workplaces and into the marketplaces because if we actually believe that there is a place where people go and they spend eternity away from God in anguish and being tormented, we should care enough, love them enough to tell them they don't have to do that, that there's a better way. But we need to let God's principles be established here on the earth and let his church advance. Why? Because the very gates of hell cannot prevail against us when we are motivated and mobilized through the power of God's Holy Spirit and let take this message to a hurting world, a hate-filled world. That is the answer. The name that this world hates the most, the name of Jesus, is the only name given among men whereby we can be saved. But not only are we praying for his kingdom and his will, when we do that, we're praying for his lordship. 
See, almost everybody who prays the sinner's prayer is looking for a savior. But that's not where it stops. Jesus Christ is my savior, but he's also my Lord. So when I pray his will over my will, I'm letting him be the Lord. I can't say, okay, God, I want you to be the Lord of my finances so that you can prosper me. I want you to be the Lord of my ministry so that it'll be successful. No, in everything that we do, he needs to be our Lord. He needs to be the one in control. If you're in control, he's not the Lord. Well, Pastor, I've given him control of 99% of my life. He's still not the Lord. If he's not the Lord of all, he's not the Lord at all. And so when you're praying for his kingdom and his will, you are submitting to his lordship. Yes, I'm happy he's my savior, but where I grow and become more Christ-like is when I allow him to be my Lord. Well, I don't think I'll like that, Pastor. Well, you may not, but he never called us to like it. Let me ask you this. Would you like to be separated from him for eternity? No. So there's things that we may do that our flesh may not like, but we are to crucify our flesh and live for him. So if we pray for and live out his will above our will every day, then we will get in the habit of not just asking him for things that we want. When we pray for and live out his will every day, that's what he's after. So we're also praying for provision and forgiveness. So when we pray, give us our daily bread, that's a good sign. Because we're thinking about others. He didn't say, pray, give me my daily bread. If I think about the children of Israel in the wilderness, that they went out and gathered the manna for the family. They would go out and they were told, get just what you need for your family today. Unless it's the, you know, the eve of the Sabbath, then you get enough for the Sabbath. And so, you know, just like today, people, you know, I'm sure some people ran out like it was a Black Friday door buster. And they're gathering all this manna and they've hoarded it, bringing it into their tent. And it rots because they're being selfish. But we're praying here, give us our daily bread don't worry about tomorrow there's enough trouble for today today we don't have to worry about today as we sang about earlier we're turning it over to God because worry worrying about things that are out of our control is nonsensical praying about things that are out of our control is wise have any of you ever gotten out of a bad situation by doing this that didn't fix it? How many of you have ever gotten out of a bad situation like this? Now, your doctor may like the exercise you got doing that, but it probably didn't get you out of the bad situation. So the next time that you catch yourself worrying, and you will, stop. Immediately. Get down on your knees and take it to the Lord. And you will find that is more of more comfort to your soul. And that's how we get answers. Answers don't come like this. Answers don't come by pacing the floor, you know, rubbing a trail in your carpeting or whatnot. But we, when we pray, we are taking a bite out of pride. We are dealing a, bro a blow to pride because when we pray we're saying I can't handle this God you're acknowledging that you're saying I'm not enough I need you and proud people don't do that so when we pray that helps us keep pride in check because we're like God I need you I can't do it I don't have the resources, I don't have the manpower, I don't have the intellect, I don't have any of the things that I need. I depend upon you. That's why he tells us to cast that care on him. Because we can't handle it. 
And in doing so, we're acknowledging that we can't handle it. It puts our pride in check, and we're saying, you are our Lord. You're also Jehovah Jireh, our provider. When we say, give us our daily bread, we're depending upon him to meet our needs. Or do we just say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll run by the store later. Shelves are stocked. You know, at the moment, there's no supply chain, a shortage. So, oh, I'll take care of it, Lord. But when we take all of our needs before him and depend upon him, we need to live in a state of dependence because he's the Lord and we subject ourselves to him. So when we pray this prayer, we're acknowledging our dependence and we're not worrying about tomorrow. We're letting the Lord handle it. Do you trust God? Has he not proven that he can be trusted? So why do we worry? And I like this about forgiveness. We have all sinned. <gasps> Me, pastor? Yes, you. When Paul wrote the church at Rome, says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. The question is, are you a sinner saved by the grace of God? So we all owed this debt that we could not pay. Jesus didn't owe a debt, but he paid it for us. He paid a debt he didn't owe. And we all want forgiveness. I'm speaking for you there because I, I hope you want forgiveness. I expect you want forgiveness. But you're like, oh, here comes the catch. Are we willing to forgive? Because they're like this. We can't go around with bitterness, grudges, hate, and say, but forgive me. Hurting that scoundrel, that, that rascal, that he did this to me. Oh, yeah, and so now I can't stand him. You know, most of the time, people don't even know if you're holding a grudge against them. Sometimes they do, but most of the time, do you know who you're hurting? You. You get a root of bitterness. Rose in you become more negative and you become more hateful and you become a person who comes over and around.
I don't need to appear before you, the Lord. John 2, 1, he pleads for us when we pray in his name. 
don't you want Jesus taking up your case when you pray? Or do you not care if your prayers are answered or not? He is our intercessor. He pleads our case before the Father. He's like, I've been there. I've had flesh. I know what they're going through. I was tempted in that same way. And you need to help them, Father. And then we see in Hebrews a beautiful picture of Jesus as our high priest. Jesus is our high priest. Luckily, we can come before him, we can approach him, we can pray in his name. And he is moved with the feeling of our infirmities because of his time being incarnated into human flesh. He knows what it's like. And finally, I want to leave you with these two verses. John 14, 13 and 14, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So never be afraid to ask God for what you want. And believe. And make, you know, and the way you pray makes a difference. You're like, well, God, I want this, and I know you're never going to give it to me. That's not the way. Pray believing in faith, not doubting. James talks about that, that we pray, we ask for wisdom and we don't doubt. We pray and we don't doubt. We pray believing and expecting for God to do it because of what he says here. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Well, why has God not answered my prayer, Pastor? Are you dead yet? No, I, I don't mean to be facetious there. I'm saying God, his timing is different from our timing. And, and yes, that has caused me quite a bit of consternation throughout my life. But because God hasn't answered your prayer to this point, don't write him off. Don't say he's never going to answer it. Because as long as there's breath in our bodies, God works when we don't see it, when we don't understand it. God is still at work. So don't let the enemy say, if he hasn't answered it by now, he's not going to answer it. To my knowledge, there are not freshness dates on prayers. There are not sell-by dates on prayers. Well, yeah, I prayed that in 1978. I don't know if he's going to answer that. The enemy wants us to believe he's not. But when we continue to believe in faith, God says, through his son Jesus, he will do these things for us. So here are these action steps as we close today. Pray God's will, not your will. Try that out and see how that works. Trust God for provision. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Forgive so that you can be forgiven. Well, I'm not going to forgive. Well, you're not going to be forgiven. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Well, I'm... Digging my heels in on this one, Pastor, I will not forgive. Well, then you're not going to spend eternity with God. Don't want you to be surprised when you wake up and you're apart from God for eternity.
Thank you. 